in place. They were young enough that I could find room for them to do some technical work because they were individual contributors. There was nothing in that company that was the same. So, I don't know if I answered that question. Who's, did, did you get the answer? Okay. Uh, I just wanted to find out about the uh, marketing uh, strategy that Intel had. Like, you know, um, you were through 386, 486, and then 20 and 2, you said. Uh, like, I used to build, uh, I used to assemble my own computer as a hobby uh, when I was like in the 90s and all. And a couple of months, like six months, one year, you would add new features to each one of those things, and you would come with a different new Mac processor. I was told that it seems Intel had a long line of uh, processors in the pipeline, and you know, uh, why wouldn't they get it, uh, like have like two or three features at the same time and bring it? Was it a marketing strategy, st strategy that Intel had uh, to capture the whole market, or like? What, They'll what be giving us too much credit to the marketing people to say that <laughs> we have ideas, but we will hold them back. <laughs> we were inside Intel. The question was, was there a deliberate marketing strategy in Intel to only release chips with one feature at a time, even though you had so many other ideas, so you can make more money? Clearly, we wanted to make more money, so no denial there. And there are many other ways we did that, and I'll give you a couple of examples of that. But uh, it'd be taking too much credit if we really had that much of smarts in our marketing, group, especially in marketing. Group. Uh, the, uh, we were always behind. Remember, we still are. Intel is still behind. It's still behind mobility today. They don't have a process for iPad and iPhone. Tell me one time in the history of Intel it was on time. Never. Uh, my first boss uh, in microprocessor was a guy named Jean-Claude Cornet. He was a French guy. He came, came from Simatel in France. He had a very thick French accent. He was a chain smoker. And he was a fighter pilot from French Air Force. So he used to drive us like a pilot does. And he would, he had a saying about Intel. He said that Intel is not the smartest company in the world. It messes up more often than anybody ever does. But it has got the biggest fire hoses in the world. <laughs> so when the fire does occur, we all pull out these fire hoses and put the fire off. That's what we are good at. So, uh, what happens inside a family and what is projected outside are two different things, for right reasons. Uh, just a little bit about marketing strategy, where we did a couple of very smart things that I think I should share with you. One is, remember, at Intel, there were two enemies. One were these host of enemies I told you in my early discussion, and then there was this enemy. AMD, AMD. Right? So you have to contend with both those enemies. Now, enemy AMD is in the enemy in the following way. If AMD has a 386 and Intel has a 386, then Intel's pricing on 386 goes down into the dumps. Because AMD goes to Compaq and says, I'll give it to you for $25 when we're charging $125. We are screwed. It costs only $5, right? But we were able to command high pricing which now we can't because Compaq says, look, what are you talking about? So the deal inside was we should always stay one generation ahead of AMD. So if they are three, we should be four. If they are four, we should be five. If they are five, we should be six, right? That way, we create our own playing field. If you want to play basketball, and not follow any of the rules, you create your own rules, you can always win the game. And that's what we want to do. We wanted to win the game by creating our own rules. So when I was on 386 Compaction, we had a 386 18 megahertz and a 24 megahertz. And then we were coming out to 486, which was 20, 33 upwards. EMD went to Compaq and said, we can give you a 386-33 megahertz. Now, Intel has no reason not to push you 
no reason for you them to yell at you for buying our chip because they don't even make a 386 that easy. Right? If you don't make it, then what excuse do you have? Compaq can say, I just, there's a market for this, I'm buying it. But we were ruthless. When we learned, I remember Andy calling me and saying, hey, can you make 33? And I recall within an hour of that, we were making 33s, very small quantities. If you know, there's a binning process, you know, in a semiconductor, there's a distribution of yields and frequencies as physics. And we just, I asked the product engineer to set up a bin, anything over 33 falling into the bin, and he, every now and then he'll have one or two or three or four, a few pieces going in there. I said, start collecting them, because who knows who even need them. <laughs> but if you truly want to play that, then you have to go redesign the chip to push to that point, because it wasn't normally designed to be that high. Because we had moved on before this. Um, I had a marketing guy. He was a colleague more than a guy reporting to me at that time. His name was Bill Rash. He came up with a brilliant strategy. And the strategy was the difference between 386 and 486 was in 486 we took 386 and 387, which was a coprocessor, floating point processor, and a 385, which was a cache. Three chips, we combined them into one, which is really the, I'm taking the fun out of doing the project, but that's basically what it was. <laughs> there was a little bit more than that, but that's what it was. So what this marketing guy did, talk about marketing strategy, he said, let's create, those days, you know, there was Coke light, Coke this, Coke that, you know, without sugar. He came up with the idea, let's create 486 light. We ended up calling it 486 SX, if you, some of you may remember, there was a 486, or it says SX, and then we created for its DX to create this superiority. It was the same stuff, you know. Uh, in SX, we disconnected just in the package, <laughs> in one pin that was connected to the floating point, we just disconnected that. In, in, in the physical bonding of the chip, the chip was 46. We amputated it, <laughs> right? And we sold it at the same price that 386, 33 megahertz from AMD was. And Compaq said, we love it. We, we have, you know, good, better, best, you know. <laughs> so we, we killed them. I mean, we did so many horrible things. When I, I had to share, share with you, <laughs> I had to share with you this other experience we had. When we came out with Pentium, the world wasn't ready for Pentium. Very few people know this too. Not only we had to contend with this whole Hollywood competition, gladly AMD had screwed up and not you know, the, the K5, right? But even all of the guys would die down. The Pentium, Compaq did not want Pentium. Why did Compaq not want Pentium? When we came out with the chip, we charged $800 for it. Nice. At that time, 486 was selling for $200. It takes them two, three years to figure out how to make money themselves, you know, because they have only 15% margin. We had. 70%, So they had just learned how to start building 46 computers and selling them and making money and being profitable and glorious. And just about that time, we go in and say, I, I remember, I have to tell you the story, the guy's name was Eckert Pfeiffer. He was a six foot, six inches tall German, three times my size. And his office was half of this room you can take and he's sitting about that table and I'd enter from that side. And I'd gone to sell him Pentium. And he had literally held my hand and taken me out and said, get out. I was vice president. He said, you get out. The reason he asked me to get out was not only there was a simple talk about buy Pentium, which he was not interested in. He said, I'm happy. That I had taken a, we had this, all these interesting stuff like Reuters, or one customer wants us to build computers, you know, in 